Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Listen, welcome to the Men of Vision podcast, man, or webcast, should I say. Um, it is my pleasure to be here tonight with you guys. I want to say first, thank you for taking the time to join um, us uh, on your busy evening. Truly appreciate it. Many of you may not know me, but I am the founder of Men of Vision Colorado, and my name is Dwayne Roberts. Also go by the name of Coach D. Rob. Listen, um, I am really ecstatic uh, about what Men of Vision is uh, doing. So listen, if you're joining me live via uh, Facebook, if you're joining me live via Zoom, listen, I need your participation tonight. I need you to jump in the chat. Let me know where you're from. Drop some ones. Let me know you're alert and alive. Tell me what city you 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 representing, where you chiming in from. Let's get comfortable. Let's grow and learn and connect in relationship together. Like the chat up for me, guys. Let me know where you guys chiming in from tonight. Woodland Park. What's up, Mr. Tim? How you doing? Was Brownie with you, buddy? Pembroke Pines. How you doing, Dr. Branker? Listen, I truly appreciate you guys uh, chiming in. Uh, as you know, Mental Vision Colorado operates out of uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, and so many of you might be asking this question, like who is this organization and what are they, they doing? What, what is it they want to be doing? Mr. Danny, Daniel from uh, Oxnard, California. Appreciate you, buddy. I see somebody's chiming in from Albuquerque as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, some of you are asking like, who is, who is this Men of Vision Colorado? So uh, let, me, let, me, let me help fill you in. You know, it was 2014. And I was sitting on my back porch and uh, I was listening to these tunes of Otis Redding. Maybe you guys are familiar with them. Sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. Listen, guys, that tune was beating in my eardrum, right? And as I was listening to this music and rocking to the beat, immediately I was jolted by this shock of electricity, of an energy, of enthusiasm. And a light bulb went off in my head. And it was in that moment that I realized that I was allowing life to pass me by. Question, how many guys or gals do you know in life are sitting aimlessly, not sure where to go and how to move? Not, don't have any direction for life, little, little timid and moving? What I find that uh, many of our ex-offenders, guys who's transitioning from, from prison, girls who transitioning from prison are stuck. They are limited. They're limited by their beliefs. They're limited by the hope that they can do anything more. Listen, when that joke struck through my body, I immediately jumped up and ran to the kitchen table, grabbed a pen and a pad, and I wrote three words down. If you got a pen and a pad, listen, write these words down. One, vision. Two, strategic planning. Three, fierce execution. Those were the three words that came to me. And I realized that many people are stuck because they lack the ability to have a vision for life. Many people are stuck because they don't have or apply the strategic plan for life. Many people are stuck because they have, are not in a position to fiercely execute. And in my belief for success, I believe that there are four pillars that support vision, planning, and execution. And they are one, identifying a God-given purpose, two, trusting in the direction in which God is leading you, three, bu building fellowship or connecting in uh, relationship, and four, giving back to your community. Those are four pillars in which men of vision establish themselves on, purpose, direction, uh, fellowship, and community. So some of you might be saying, well, who are you? Well, listen, let me help you with that. For the past 20 years, I've led and trained uh, US military, churches, and nonprofits. Uh, I have a current, currently have a degree in uh, biblical studies, as well as in organizational management and Christian leadership. I am a DIS certified facilitator, and I help ex-offenders take action to achieve their vision for success so they can, one, uh, fulfill their purpose, 
and two, maximize on their potential. I believe that there's some core elements to really helping individuals gain that, that stability in life, which start with first self-awareness. So I, I, I built this program called the 21 Day Success Builder, where I take these individuals to a holistic approach about who they are to really gravitate to, to identify some core substance about self. And then we go through a week training of uh, leadership principles and growth, all uh, designed and established uh, to draw from them their strength, identify some limitations, to better communicate, and to help them find functionable jobs that they are great at. See, something I found out recently, oh, not recently, but uh, during, during this, this, uh, this, 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 this stage in, of growth for myself was that uh, Minivision's aim is to really help put a dent into recidivism, you know, and break the cradle from prison pipeline, as well as uh, helping juveniles, those delinquents that find themselves caught up in the system, really establish some structure for themselves. And so that's our, that's our key goal to really uh, uh, motivate and help individuals that uh, uh, that find themselves stuck. They transitioning from prison back into society, and they haven't been able to find their core uh, traction or grip or, or motivation or uh, momentum for life. And we take this this uh, holistic approach to really build. Uh, and, and, and confirm the individual within. Listen, I know many of you joined on tonight, and uh, we came in, we came together because uh, I, I I I believe that as uh, to, for ex offenders to really uh, to develop, they 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 must be able to be able to make connection with individuals uh, that who are doing just that. Guys who sat in their uh, sat in their shoes or sat in the, sat where they sat where they sat. Uh, guys or, or gals who have uh, experienced some of the things that they experience um, that they can kind of relate to and connect with. And so some of the core uh, of what I, uh, I am establishing here tonight is really uh, highlighting individuals who have gone through the process, who found themselves locked up behind bars, and today are making an impact, uh, not only in their lives, but within their community and in the lives of others. So my question for you, before we get started, I truly appreciate you chiming in, but um, before we get started, we're talking from, uh, from lockup to success. Life lessons that develop winners. My question, what, what did I write? Oh. <laughs> what would you identify as a winning attitude in life for yourself? for yourself, a winning attitude for yourself. In the chat, drop in the chat, let me know what you would think is a winning attitude for life for yourself. You know, uh, recently here, we just, many of you probably chimed in and watch uh, uh, Tom Brady win his seventh uh, NFL championship. I mean, I, I'm here to tell you, you can't, you can't say this dude isn't a winner, but many of us have different outlooks on winning. You know, we, we're coming into the, the first quarter of the new year. We 30, a little over 30 days in. Some of you have established uh, some goals for yourself and maybe you have accomplished those, those, that first goal for yourself. If you accomplish that first goal for yourself, do you see yourself as winning in life? Listen, in the chat, let me know what does winning look like for you? That's right, Angela. I appreciate it, Miss Angela. Uh, achieving what you set out to do, absolutely. You know, uh, many many of us have this uh, this misconception about about success. You know, um, and and in so many words, for me, success is not so much the big house, 
the, the, the fluffy car, the fat bank account, but it's a, the ability to be able to do, to bring your dream and vision to fruition, to work that thing, to work your purpose in life and to sow seeds in the lives of others. Much to what uh, Angela is saying, uh, addresses here, achieving what you set out to do. Listen, guys, we got winners in the room. I, I know uh, some of you personally, and, and, and many I may not know, but if you're watching via uh, Facebook, I just want you to know that you are a winner and winners do some big things, man. And because winners do some great big things, I want to introduce you to uh, a, a, a guy I met and I find that he is winning in life. Guys, he's winning in life. He's winning. <clears throat> uh, his name is Danny Morales. Danny, uh, chime, let, me, let me, hold on real quick, Danny, me. I don't know what, how do I, can you come in? Oh, there we go. Danny, chime in with me, buddy. How are you today? Danny I'm Morales. Wonderful. I am wonderful. Glad to be here with you. Guys, if you don't know, this is Danny Morales. He is the founder of Castillo del Estelon LLC. They are an agriculture business and development company. Danny, please, I hope I did justice to the name of your company, but by all means, introduce yourself to the people, tell the people what you do and what impact you bring in, uh, to, to the lives of others today. All right, well, um, Castillo de Aslan is, um, our, it's a castle. I live in a castle, so Castillo is castle, and Aslan is the primordial homeland of my ancestors. So I'm trying to recapture that history and create awareness of my culture as part of my core values. But what we're doing is we're developing um, livestock in different type of protein production that can be um, sold at cost uh, to help food insecure families in the Colorado Springs area by partnering up with some of the local food uh, nonprofits. Um, another project I have is I have a couple houses that I rent out and one of my houses right now has um, uh, offenders, uh, guys on parole, um, where yeah, that they're living together in a shared living arrangement where they can come together for fellowship, support and accountability of one another. And I also spend a lot of time talking and mentoring them and just sharing uh, and, and being a, a helpful hand um, in, in their progression. I did seven and a half years in prison and I've been out on parole for about eight and a half now. So I know exactly where they are. And so you, 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 you spent seven, seven and a half years and you've been out eight years, you said? Yeah. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Wow. So, so, so what has that, this experience been like for you now? Um, been out for eight eight and a half years, you, you, you've been trying to get some things together. Um, I guess, let me, let me back up, let me ask this question. Who were you prior to going into prison? What, what, who would you say Danny was prior to going into prison? Well, um, I come from a town in Santa Barbara, California and um, I uh, grew up in, and got involved in gangs, joined the military to kind of escape that craziness in California, and uh, eventually ended up in a tent special forces group um, where I got to do a, a lot of high level uh, military work. And, uh, but I was very arrogant. I was very, you know, I was very athletic. So I, you know, I had a, a whole life of privilege of being a male, um, being a successful, winning, in sports and winning in my military career, but um, you know that that's where I was at. I thought I knew I had all the right answers, but I really didn't. Mm. Oh, that's real good. So, so you you were winning early in life, but you thought you had all the right answers, but you realized you didn't. Um, what? <laughs> I, I, what's some things that, in reflecting? You know that can you say that uh, you can identify that 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 were, were not right answers, but help develop you along the way that, that to, to make some change, bring some change into your life. 
Well, some of the life lessons I was learning early on is life is short. And um, in that, you know, you got to work hard. You know, I have a, a great father who is an educator and, you know, put a lot of things in front of me. I actually wrote a poem about his, uh, my interaction with my father, and it got published a few uh, several years back. But, uh, you know, it's really about developing. I always had this belief that I can succeed and I needed to develop my abilities so I could perform when opportunity arose. And Okay, so no, that's, that's good. You always believed in yourself. You understood who you were. Um, and, and you took a, you took advantage of, of of opportunities. What would you say to people who uh, who don't recognize opportunity when it show up? What what would you say to those? Like for you, you you recognize opportunity to to take advantage of. What would you say to the individual who simply went doesn't recognize opportunity because he didn't know what it looks like to succeed? Um, well, I think. Um... Huh? Uh, who's me? Looks like someone Daniel Morales joined. Huh. Well, I guess that's my father, maybe. Um, all right. So uh, I think it's uh, what I, I kind of I got distracted with a beeping, and I had to let someone in the, in the meeting. I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat that question, please? <laughs> so, well, um, got me thinking now. <laughs> sorry so about what, that. What 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 would you say to someone? Who, who's struggling to, be, to, to find that belief in developing themselves, uh, stepping out into to the uh, actionable steps to, 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 to advance, to recognize. Well, yeah, so first off, you gotta realize why you have self-doubt and that's fear. Fear of embarrassment, fear of failure, um, even fear to succeed because we have all these self-beliefs that are really destructive on, you know, we've been taught depending on your circumstances, that you're no good, or you can't do it, or that's only for others to do. And when you start to believe all that, from all that acculturation and programming, it will weigh down on you. So what really has to occur in your life is this um, developing this self-belief that you, what any one person can do, you can do as well. And the way you get there is developing um, a, a habit of never knocking yourself down, don't, whenever you catch yourself saying, oh, that was stupid, don't do that. And then I think the second thing is putting, feeding yourself with a lot of information. Don't be wasting your time just watching junk TV, watch documentaries. Don't read just novels and, and read things, uh, uh, you know, those love stories. Read some books that are, you know, self-development books. Uh, and be, when someone says, hey, can you do this? Don't say no, say, yeah. And, and if you don't have the tools at that moment, well, I'm sure you're going to have a couple of days before you have to perform that task that someone asked you to volunteer for and just do some research and get ready to go. No, that, that's real good, man. That's real good. We got a, uh, a question in the chat from Dr. Brank, Carl Branker. And he said, he, his question is, did, did you have help after prison to get to where you are now? I mean, that's a challenging question. Because when I got out of parole, uh, got on parole, um, my family had already moved away. So I came out, but I did own a house. Um, so that was, you know, one thing. Um, I, I, when I first got out, this, oh, I actually, I, I was on uh, at the halfway house and I got regressed originally. Um, I wanted to start a business and they didn't want me to and I had some challenges there. So I got sent back, but I had made a relationship in the, in the company uh, the uh, motorcycle shop, and he really, uh, you know, enjoyed me working for him and the money I could make. I was making him. I became his general manager, so I paroled initially to his house. So in a sense, it was a mentor re uh, relationship going on there. And so I had a, a roof over my head. I had a job, and but the problem is that relation was kind of toxic because I, I, my, my role was to make him money. And so he didn't have any vested interest in me, the person. Mm. Um, but after that, when I started, um, you know, pursuing my education, I would meet teachers who would be enthralled with my enthusiasm for learning. Another key point, be enthusiastic in all your interactions. And they would, uh, you know, bring me to opportunities. And one of my professors, uh, uh, the entrepreneur professor that I had, 
um, I helped launch this uh, project at the school, which is it's called it's a it's a startup incubator called the Garage at UCCS, and um, he introduced me to this uh, CEO Patrick Boltima, and uh, just raved about how good I was and this and that. And I was trying to sell the man a fishing rod, and it turns out, uh, you know, at the same time I didn't make that sales one of my few sales I never made, but I said to him, I'm about to start my master's. I'm looking for some part time work. Do you know of anything? And he goes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. You have a resume? I said, I sure do. And I went into my, into my bag, pulled out a resume and uh, he interviewed me a week later. And I, you know, another week after that, I helped kick off uh, uh, and launch a company that now is in four states. So, you know, being prepared opportunity. I did a little research about that man before I met with him, by the way. <laughs> No, I like it. No, that's good. That, 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 I think that's great advice for everybody, you know, uh, being able to research, know who you're dealing with. Um, I, I, and I think that's a key aspect of truly understanding and knowing who you are. You know, uh, most people, most people won't move like that. Um, and, and part of what I like to, to help men do is become self-aware, because when you understand who you are, when you understand your strengths, when you understand your limitations, man, you can figure out some ways and, and, and be innovative in your approach to take advantage of opportunity, much uh, to like you did in, in that successful move of, of identifying and doing your research on this guy. So my next question. Hmm. Okay, um, I see uh, another question. How, how, how did you deal with uh, negative, negative letdowns, um, especially after having done your time, how does, the felony charge affect you today? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think developing good coping skills around rejection, because for me, that's a real triggering event. Uh, early in life, I had so much early success that rejection wasn't a thing that really happened too often. But when it did, it was like, oh, my whole world's falling apart. So um, I kind of go into a lot of events, especially when it job seeking events, if that's, I mean, I really don't get to, I get a lot of job offers is what I, and I turn them down is my problem because uh, everybody wants a guy who can get, get it done. And so, but um, I've had, you know, numerous opportunities that uh, I remember this one opportunity I had to go to Texas to um, become a, a meat broker. I was going to be a millionaire and selling meat across the world. And it was a really good job. And I got recommended by uh, a businessman that I know. And when I went down there, well, right before I was about to go down there, I'm sorry, um, it, my criminal background came up and all of a sudden that job wasn't there for me. And I literally just left my job to go do that job. I was like, ah, oh, I was going to make working from home, making tons of money. And that was a very disappointing thing. But instantaneously, I go, hey, I got two houses. I got two mortgages I got at that time, and I got to go find work. So I started searching, and you know, next thing I know, I landed a really good job in solar, and I uh, did that for a year and make some money there. And But, yeah, it's, it's, I think I, whenever I look at disappointment now is once one door closes, the next door will open. And I think what really comes down to about do forget about disappointments. If you're not really – set up with your right attitude. And that's where I've evolved to now is my attitude is a supremely positive. Uh, I'm always looking for silver linings. The glass is never half empty. I, you know, I'm always looking through a lens of positivity because then I could see the opportunities in any negative situation, you know? Oh man, I just had soldier surgery. I, I can't do, I can't take care of my animals. I can't um, go fishing and I love fishing, but I'm thinking, okay, I can get, Hey, I want to be down for a while. Let me go start a PhD and I'll have plenty of time to read because I can't really go out and play. So I'm always looking at things as what's the positive out of anything and what can I learn from it so I can have a better outcome next time. Man, that 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 is awesome. No, that that's real good. I, I I like what you said. Having a positive outlook and what can I learn from that? Oftentimes, uh, through for myself, I know, um, and I try to encourage others this too. Is do uh 
lessons learned. Reflecting back on on uh, your past week, some gains, some losses in life, things that you didn't do so well, things that you uh, you did do well, and what were the what were those outcomes, and what did you learn from those from those things? Um, and off and and doing that really helps me for myself in in, uh, in in producing and developing the results that I look I'm looking for. But listen, you said something here. Um, and having that positive out outlook, my question for you is: uh, What were you, what were your ethics? What what eth but prior to going into prison, and what were some things that you recognized that you needed to change uh, about yourself uh, to really uh, become the person you you wanted to be once you uh, you you were back? What were you cultivating? Well, I think growing up, you know. I wasn't always the most talented athlete, but I was the hardest worker. And I was always on the starting team because I, I was, you know, working harder than the average player who had less, who had more talent. But then in the work environment, I was working three jobs, military, and two other jobs, or actually I had a side business, a, jo a pizza delivery job, and then the military. And so I spent a lot of hours just working and I was coaching soccer and volunteering. So I was always so active. I had so much energy and zest for life. So that was what I had that I needed to always maintain. And when I went into the prison system, I had the same kind of attitude. I mean, I was down for a minute, for a second. I was like, oh, this, is, this is pretty terrible. Um, but I made, I, laid, I made the bed, I laid in it. So then from there, I started to use that same energy. So I started, I helped uh, build a business in the Colorado Correctional Industries. Uh, making custom fly rods and I helped build that company all the, uh, that business inside and it was an inmate run business and we had uh, different um, uh, staff members help us you know get the word out and I sold $150,000 in fishing rods I taught GED so then I was giving back to my parole or my uh, prison inmates and I did book clubs and we did um, other things where uh, you know, we're exercising, just reading and reading and I was going to college in there. So I was still doing my busyness. So that's a skill that I had. That's a passion I had. That's a ethic that I had. Hard work, hard work, never rest, you know, don't be lazy, all those things. And so when I got into, um, you know, going to school, I was always getting my homework done on time and doing the best work I could possibly do. And then when I got that corporate job and in that startup space, I, I, when the, I was always make sure that I was the first one. Well, I wasn't always the first one there, but I was always there right before the CEO arrived and I would be working all day long. And when that CEO left, then I left right after him. So I, so then, so here's the things that I learned after. So I had this hardworking ethic, but hard work, I worked hard in that motorcycle shop. I gave him countless hours without pay because I was volunteering my time to learn the job. But see, the problem was I wasn't being strategic with my time mm -hmm. and how I positioned myself within the company. Mm -hmm. I showed myself to be a free hard worker. And so he didn't have to pay me. And in the corporate work setting, I became the guy who led with the most sales. That's important more than anything. But I also gave the perception of my um, dedication and hard work. And then I also started strategically putting in some of my uh, um, conversations that highlighted my value to the company. Yeah. So that's a new thing that I started learning is how to be strategic in my presentation of this hard work ethic. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? It does. It does. No, that that's real good. Um, just just having that that strategic mindset. Um, really out uh, out planning, outsourcing, out thinking. Um, your next move, almost as as a, a, a expert chess champion, right? But you said something. You were strategic with your time. You know, and I, I want you to I want you to hone in and tap on that because one thing that I find is that uh, many many people transitioning from uh, uh, prison, they spend a lot of time behind bars, and it's like uh, they wasted so much time. And when they get out, like there's no there's no connection to to this real world, you know, like to society. Like, not I'm back, but I have time. Like, it, is it? Do you think that that their uh their they their uh their approach to to picking up momentum back in society, uh, the lack of visibility of time in prison, uh, may hinder. Uh, how they how how one may function or or recon, reconnect in the community because they're not strategic about their time. Well, I think what happens is when you have so much time to kill, 
time is irrelevant. There's very few deadlines. You know, there's deadlines for when the food is called. There's deadlines for getting out to go play in the yard and <laughs> go lift weights or play sports. And so, yeah, it, when you get out, there was not a much of a sense of urgency because that stuff's going to be there tomorrow. Oh, I didn't get to go to the library today. Damn it. I didn't get to check out a book. Well, you know, the book's going to be there tomorrow. So I think what happens is, and, and I think uh, one of the key about having a positive attitude, and that's important, but you have to have a sense of urgency. Not that you have to go recapture all the time that you lost, because you're not going to be able to. But the sense of urgency is how you, how you uh, um, conduct yourself in every moment. Are, am I giving myself 100% of my effort in this particular moment? Why do I want to get to where I want to go? Because if, if I'm good with you know, the 20-year plan, um, but it really should be a five-year plan, yeah, you're never going to get to that 20 year, you know, that 20 year goal because you're, you're not, you're not thinking you can do more than you can. Yeah. So a sense of urgency in all your action. Um, I think one thing I haven't even mentioned though, this is almost more important than, you know, it's good to develop your value system and your purpose, but you really have, and your passion and what you, you, what you stand for. Right. But you have to reward yourself along the way. You have to have something you want just for you that you want, I'm gonna do all this extra work so I can get to do what? What is that important to you? And for me, it was fishing. So mm -hmm. what can I do all week long to get that work done and make the money so I could cover my bills so I can go out and go fishing? That was my thing, especially, it wasn't like the most glamorous thing. People go fishing all the time. But for me, being behind bars away from the earth, it was extremely important for me to get outside and be reconnect with Ushimaka, which is Mother Earth. And that was, I think, more than anything, you know, I had, you know, we had to talk about vision and all these different things. Some of those things uh, for me, the most important thing that kept me motivated was the next weekend, knowing that that's my goal. I got a plan. I got the right flies. I got my poles, got my truck already. And that, that's what I'm working for. But it was a healthy outlet. It's not like I'm, I, I'm going to the club on Saturday. I can't wait. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to get drunk. I was thinking about doing something positive, which didn't have a, you know, a detrimental effect on my life, which is a good goal. So that was kind of a key because you can't, you have to have balance in all your life. You can't work super hard. You're going to burn out. You have to have a little bit of play in there too. No, I like that. No, that's real good. Um, that that's real talk. Uh, because, um, Matter of fact, we we got a picture of you on 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 the flyer. Uh, what what kind what kind of fish was that? Where and where were you? Well, that is a cut bow, so it's a crossbred between a rainbow and a cutthroat. And I can't tell you where it's at because it's a secret. Um, it's my secret <laughs> top spot. secret. And I put some big fish back in there, and so I know they're still in there. So I'm gonna go back and get them and get a little bigger. <laughs> That's what's up. No, I love it. That's good stuff. But all right, so. Um, you tapped on a few things here. Um, and, 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 and I like what you said that it can't be all work. You got to reward yourself, you know, um, that you got to be able to give a hundred percent effort and must truly know the why, why, why am I doing the thing that I'm doing? Hi, Deborah. <laughs> nice seeing you, ma'am. Good seeing you. Great and, and so, to be here. Sorry, I was running a little late, but sure it's great to see everybody. Good, good. Uh, so, um, yeah, you, you hit on some real tangible uh, uh, points here. Uh, I want to I want to transition just a little bit now. So uh, recidivism, you know, we know that 68 uh, percent uh, of ex-offenders uh, get rearrested within three years. We also know that 79 percent of those uh, individuals that uh, ex-offenders get rearrested. I'm sorry, hold on, I said that wrong. Uh, 60, yeah, 68 percent within three years uh, get uh, rearrested, and then I think it's another. I want to say 78 percent within nine years get rearrested. Um, what What would you say were some are some key triggers to recidivism? Well. Got me scared of shaking my boots because I'm at eight and a half years, damn, <laughs> knocking on some wood. Um, so healthy fear. 
So that's different than debilitating fear and ir irrational fear. So a healthy fear is knowing that what this choice has consequences. What can, what can I lose from that choice? All right. Um, the other thing was um, you're asking what are the things that uh, to, to help people or what are the pitfalls? Yeah, what what are the pitfalls? What uh, oh, yeah. what do, or what do you think are some things that uh that that can help them as well too? So, but let's okay. identify both. both okay. All right. So another thing is called a victim stance. That's that mental state where you think that everything that is happening to you isn't of your own making and that you're the victim in this. That is the a, a primary reason because from there you're gonna move to entitlement. You're gonna think that. Well, since I've been wronged, I'm entitled to do something what I want. So that kind of thinking errors are uh, very problematic. Um, I think a lot of guys wouldn't want to admit this, but having um, low self-esteem, there's this unrealistic self-esteem that, you, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, masked with egotism and, and hyper-masculinity. But I think... Um, when it comes down to um, being this humble and, and living in humility and gratitude, that counteracts the, uh, um, this uh, facade of, of confidence because you really have to have a belief in self or none of this is gonna work. It don't even matter. Uh, you have a car, you have a, a, a wife and you have um, a roof over your head and you have a good paying job. And none of that will even last if you don't have a belief in self and know who you are, know what you stand for. Because if not, you're just going to be blown in the wind, moving whatever the wind blows. Um, I think uh, focused goals. You got to have focused goals. Um, have a desire to um, be. What is your legacy in this world? What am I even doing here? Knowing you know that what I'm doing now has impact and ripples down the road. And do I want those ripples to be tidal waves ruining people's lives? Or do I want them to be gentle um, encouragement to others that can be useful? And I said, because I grew up in a place where it was a lot of violence and hurt and I don't, and I've hurt people. And so the idea is never to hurt again. Um, and so keeping that in, in the beginning, you know, in your mind. So anytime you start feeling like you're the victim, you remember, Hey, I, I'm the, I'm the perpetrator. I'm not the victim here. And when you're talking about disappointments about, you know, jobs like Dr. Um, Doctor, uh, I don't see his name right here. Um, but the question he had asked, Doctor Brank, yeah, how you deal with uh, disappointment is recognize that hey, it's just a moment, and you can't swing into victim stance because once you go there, it's all downhill, and you're not going to be able to uh, really, um, you know, recover from that spinning cycle. Um, I think another thing is, you know, this attitude of you're never going to quit. So, pro officers. And uh, people who are not happy with your offending be, uh, past or who hold that against you, they all want to see you. Um, well, I take that back. Uh, I don't want to. I have a, a pro officers. Uh, they don't want to see you fail, but they're there to protect the community. So you, and if you do fail, they're gonna have to put you back in prison. So people that are not supporting your your development are gonna to wanna to see you fail. So why help them by quitting? Why, and you know, quitting could be not just I quit, it could be, I'm just gonna go get drunk tonight. That's quitting, you know, you're quitting on yourself because you're the only one who's gonna hurt beyond your family members who are gonna miss you as you're gone. So never quitting or the thing to fear is quitting. And that's a, that's a thing that happens so often. I see so many guys who I've been on parole with who went, got sent back is they just said, F it, I quit. Yeah. Uh, maybe they didn't say it out loud, but that's what the body language showed and that's what their actions showed. So never quit. Um, I think those are pretty much the main, you know, and I'll, always build on your skills. Always, you don't have to go to school to get educated. You just keep on educating yourself, always putting in good information. No, that's real good. And, and, and you tapped on this thing about uh, parole officers. Um I know, I know they got difficult jobs, no doubt about that. Um, really having to um, not be played by these individuals, um, really ensuring that they protecting the community and things of that nature. But um, 
can you highlight uh, what, 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 what's some struggles that you found um, when working with, with, with parole, parole, parole officers? Um, well, when I first got out, I was at this uh, halfway house called Concord. You know them, you talk to them. And um, I had uh, wanted to start my own business. And he says, no, but I want you to get another job. And he didn't really give me a reason. He just said no. And I fell into victim stance. And so I was really, you know, distraught. And I had it all lined up. My father and my stepmother were help organizing it. And we were, you know, we even spent some money on it that we lost because of this. And, you know, that really, you know, set me up and it, it set my, I set myself up to get into that victim stance. And then I, you know, he kept on accusing me of different, doing different things. And he handcuffed me to a chair for four hours till I admitted to what I did. And, and at the end of the day, he, he sent me back. Um, and, you know, I learned, a, you know, a little bit about that is that, you know, you, the power of your, cause I'm a self-determining individual. I want to be, but at the same time, officers are not going to want what I want there, you know, and so I'm going to have to uh, bide my time and show them that my ideas and what I want to do, or if I keep on wanting to do like, so education, uh, you know, um, this officer I had was, his name was Officer Leopard, and um, he was a real supportive of me leaving a job to go to school and start my own business. So that was complete polar opposite of what the other officer had presented to me. And over time, I had him for many years and then he, they, they do this thing where they have to trade their guys off from time to time. And then I got another pro officer and then I got him back again. And so I've had three good officers, Officer Martinez, Officer Leopard and Officer Allison. And I had a couple others in between, but they weren't there very long. But the, the thing is that I had to learn is what can I do to show them that I'm worthy of their help, worthy of their support? And the way I do that is to speak consistently with my behavior, um, with my communication, be open and transparent, be vulnerable. They usually throw me out of their office because I talk too damn much and they're tired of hearing about all my emotional needs. Literally, I, um, I've even tonight, when uh, one of the officers was going to come to watch this, and I think they're here, and her supervisor was like, "Well, is this going to be all night?" Because he knows he had me for years, and he knows I'll, you know, I'll talk all night. And, but that's the thing is like I made myself a person, and I think in just in general in life strategy. Um, obviously, I've read a lot of books, but one of the books that I read was pretty powerful was Robert from Robert Cialdini, a professor in Arizona in psychology. And so I use this in sales, I use this in life. And what, what it comes down to is this formula, familiarity and similarity equate to likability. And people wanna help who they like, people wanna buy from who they like. And so what it comes down to is, what can I do to, because I'm, I'm a multicultural person, I'm multifaceted, I have a lot of interests. What can I do in a given moment to share information that will, the, my given audience, will say, oh, he's just like me, or I know that person, or he has this, he likes to do the same things I like to do. And in the back of their minds, man, I like that guy. And next thing you know, they're give, offering me jobs, they're offering me opportunities. And, it's, and they think it's because I'm this great guy, but really I'm just familiar and similar to them when a, 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 before, a moment before that I was just a stranger. Yeah. So, so, so in, in so many words, man, you tap on, you tap in right down on my lane, man. And, and that is behaviors, um, really being able to understand your behavior and un identifying others' behaviors. I think that's key too, uh, uh, for, for not just the, the ex offender, but for, for the parole officer, when that parole officer understands their position as a leader, um, as well as being able to identify key uh, likability traits, behavior traits in the other individual that will open up uh, a, a access door, a door of opportunity. You know, um, when, I, when, when I hear you speak speak like that and say, uh, describe how, how these individuals were really drawn to you, I think they were drawn to you because they recognize uh, not just only your potential, but uh, they, recognize, they recognize the behavior, you know, the, the pattern. Um, the commitment, understanding that, hey, D Danny is uh, 
uh, highly focused. You know, he's uh, he's very driven. He's passionate about what he's doing, um, that he he's result uh, oriented. He's looking to produce results. You know, he's not he's not coming in here shooting me a hot ticket of gas and, and not producing. And, and when when uh, I believe when parole parole officers really understand uh, behavior patterns that they can find something tangible uh, and confirm uh, what they see in that particular individual, you know, likability, you say produces what? Um, like, uh, yeah, familiarity, similarity equate to likability. And then people like to do things for people they like. People like to give opportunities to people they like. People like, and it's really um, a process of sales for my sales yep. training throughout the yep. years, but mm -hmm. they people want to buy from who they like. They don't care about the company is like, who's your sales rep? And a guy who has a horrible price and a horrible product, they'll choose him if he's more likable than me, who has right. a great offer. Right. No, that's good. That's good. I, I was reading a book recently. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't remember the title of it, but um, the guy was, he was talking um, that uh, a couple came in to purchase a vehicle. Um, they were asking a bunch of detailed questions and because he understood behavior patterns and, and, and styles um, and they were actually, they came into a Chevy dealership and they were actually looking for a Ford. And so <laughs> Uh, he sent them to the to back over to the Ford dealer, but he he sent them to a specific dealer. You know, go ask for Tom or or Todd. You know, he'll be able to help you out, sell you a great car. Well, of course, because uh, the Chevy dealer understood behaviors, he sent them to the most aggressive salesperson. You know, and so when they went over to go go check out the Ford, they were so frustrated with dealing with the the the, the behavior style of, of the Ford dealership. They came back over to Chevy, and old dude was able to sell them a Chevy truck, and they really wanted a Ford. <laughs> you know, so it really go back to what you're saying. People people are uh, um, uh, are connected. They do they do for people that they like. They work. They buy from those that they like, and and that's I think that's a very tangible statement. Um, and, and key to, key component and element to to uh, to to what's happening in, in in these environments. So let me ask you. Um, you, you shared that uh, so, so some parole officers were for, were favorable, some what weren't. Um, what was what was the strategy uh, for you in that time, like? Uh, what strategy would you find to 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 be able to use for yourself not to get over not 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 to not to to, to pull a, a fast one but what strategy could you say for yourself that hey listen i can implement this strategy i understand uh he doesn't see me he doesn't see me in this fashion he doesn't understand this behavior he doesn't understand my passion but i really i really want to do this how how can i how can I prove myself? Because from, from what I hear, you've been proving yourself from, from the beginning. You've been absolutely uh, uh, knocking down every, every door, every window, every opportunity that presented itself. How would you handle, how have you handled those rough situations in time where uh, you just, you didn't win that buy-in? Well, I mean, when I first met Officer Leopard, when I got out on parole the second time, well, the actual first time, but he come all the way to my uh, uh, residence, which was a mansion. So he was kind of impressed, but he wasn't impressed with me. He don't know me. Um, and so I had, you know, wanted to, you know, date a woman and I had to get it approved through him. And he did a background check and he didn't like what he saw. So he said, no, I was like, wow okay, this is, the, they're real about this. This is how, this is how it's going to be. It's not going to be like, if I want they told me, if you want to be in a relationship, just let me know. And, you know, but it isn't that easy. He said, no, I did ask. So I said, all right, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to focus on that. And, you know, I want to do all these different things, but I'm not even going to ask because you know what? I got 10 years of parole. I got a, I got a long haul. I, I don't need to rush. I'll just wait. And so after a year or so, or I don't even know how long it was, maybe six months, seven months, he's like, why don't you uh, try to get in a relationship? You haven't uh, brought no one to me. He says, oh, well, you said no last time. And, you know, 
said, no, you know what? I, this Because they set goals for us every six months, every three months or six months. Yeah, every six months, they set goals for us. So I want you to work on um, developing relationships in the community. So he came to me asking me to go make a relationship, get, get in, well, to seek out relationship opportunities where before when I asked him, he said, no. So I said, oh, this is how this is going to go. So then I really want to go fishing, but I'm not going to ask for fishing. So I waited a year and a half and he goes, you know, you work all the time and you know, you did get the girlfriend now, she lives with you, that's great. Um, but what do you do for recreation? I said, I don't know, our relationship's kind of suffering because we can't go nowhere. He says, well, what do you guys really want to do? He says, well, I want to go fishing. You know, we want to go fishing, go up in the mountains. You know, like we live in Colorado, I love the mountains. Well, they put in a safety plan for a couple lakes and a couple rivers. And I'll, you know, so now I already know it's going to be approved because he's the one who asked me to do it. Yeah. And that's kind of a strategy. I think a lot of guys who are first coming out, don't come out just trying to ask for everything. Let them ask you to ask for things. And then guess what? It's going to be approved because they're the one asking you to ask. <laughs> but that's all, that's all right, my man. That's all right. You, 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 you are full of strategies. You are full of innovative approaches. Um, you really come up with some, uh, some outstanding performances and how you produce your results. So listen, uh, uh, before I go into question, uh, questions and answer and guys listen if you got a question uh after this one please don't hesitate ask danny what's on your mind uh, if you got a question for me by all means let's open up the mic for a few minutes um and, and uh and see how we can uh better learn and grow together so my last question for you danny is uh give me two actionable steps for for an ex-offender that's listening um he's fresh out uh two weeks he two weeks out and uh, he's just trying to, he's trying to figure it out. He's, he's frustrated, he's aggravated. He don't know what to do. How, what's two actionable steps of advice you can give him? Well, I mean, the first thought comes to mind is first reflect. Because if you're feeling anxious, you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling you know, I remember when I first got out, I thought everybody, when I'm walking down the street, knew I was just got out of prison. I really thought that. And so that that is internal. It's hard to check how to give you a, a camera checkable way to handle that. But first of all, you need to acknowledge that you are overwhelmed. You are in a whole new environment that you haven't been in in a long time. So you need to step back away from that and reflect on how are you feeling? and how, and, and put that into perspective and recognize. Uh, so the actionable thing is to read books from um, uh, um, people who have been uh, done time and been released because they'll always talk about that, how to cope with that first couple of weeks of getting out. So first actionable action is read, all right? And I think within that, I always read and write, read, write, and rewrite. So I read, I journal, I read, I journal, I take notes, get my ideas out and put it on paper. I, sometimes I used to back in the day, I used to sleep next to a, a little pad and I'll be in the middle of sleep. I wake up and I go, oh, that's a great idea. And I write it down. That way I wouldn't forget it because in the morning I always forgot it. So I was like, man, I could have been a millionaire 20, 20 times over. Um, so that's actionable. The second thing is there are so many people in this community that would help you transition. I didn't know about them. I didn't utilize them, but there's like Tim and Brownie's organization, uh, Hope Advance. Yes. They, if you came in there with the right attitude, they're gonna bend over backwards to make you su successful. And I've seen them do it with some other offenders. Absolutely. Um, I think you, you know, I would say, and I have, I tell them they don't call you. And that's the part that irks me is that, you know- Don't call me, Danny. Yeah, I give them the number and they, and they complain that they got nothing going on and no opportunities, <laughs> but they ain't even call anybody to try to, find out what's out there. So I think seek out support, build your network right away. Cause you might not, you just got out. And I, I, when I just got out, I got lucky in a sense that I started working in a motorcycle shop that had hundreds of customers coming through. I was networking. And as soon as matter of fact, how I left the motorcycle shop, I started my own shop with another customer and we had our own shop down in Drennan and we're doing custom builds and everybody knew me. I still get phone calls now asking me how to fix their bike as I haven't done that in seven years. And they say, well, I know you don't work on a mobile, but hey, I got this problem. Can you help me fix it? I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. So build that network. 
And even though it's day one, day, you know, you reach out to one person, they know, like you reach out to Tim and Brownie, they know hundreds of people and they will introduce you to the next one. And that's how you move forward is through, who, it's not, you don't get jobs because what you're good at, you get jobs because of who you, you know. And if you don't know anybody, you better know one person who knows someone else who will get you that job. Absolutely. Man, good stuff, man. I like that. Read, write, network, connect. Man, that's real good stuff, man. I really appreciate you, man, uh, taking the time, uh, chiming in, sharing your experiences with us. Listen, guys, I'm going to open the mic up, man. If you would, raise your hand if you got a question for Danny and I, and uh, let's address your questions before we close out. DJ, I see you with hand up, boss. Go ahead. Uh, can you unmute yourself, sir? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So my question to Danny would be, if you had to recommend one book, <laughs> I know it's going to be tough. <laughs> if you had to recommend one book for somebody who, let's say they've done 20, 30 years in prison, they're about to get out. And they have no, they have no family, no support or anything, and they're looking for, I don't know, maybe some information, direction, or inspiration. What would you, what would you recommend? The Shambhala teachings by Trump Paul something something. I got the book over here. Um, <laughs> it really, uh, that book embodies, um, you know, Eastern philosophy. But it's uh, really coming from the 10 Special Forces Group, you know, we talk about being quiet professionals. So you know you can kill somebody, but the idea is you don't, ne you don't never need to be aggressive because you already know you know how to kill someone 10 different times. If they're a threat, you could kill them if you had to. So it's really about knowing that you are the most powerful person in the world to yourself. And any future you want, any belief that you want, any goal that you want can be achieved, can be achieved if you understand that you're the only limitation mm. on you. Good. If you have that belief of self, and that's what that book really shares is like this, how to understand the world that it's not this external forces playing around and controlling you. And I think that's that first book. I would recommend you read it a month before you get uh, someone got out. So they can just like, wait, oh my God, I'm in charge of this world. I can do anything. And I can hurt somebody, but I don't want to because I shouldn't have to hurt anybody because I have confidence in knowing that I don't have to throw a tough front to intimidate someone to not hurt me because I know if I had to, I can hurt them. And that's the key is like, that's that balance that you know that you are all powerful, oh. but you're not going to use your power to, to be bad. Oh, and that's what that book kind of really brings home, I think. And, I, you know, for someone in that case, if it was a gang member who had been locked up for 10 years, I would tell him to read Richard Rodriguez's book, um, La, La Vida Loca, um, Gang Days in L.A. That book is transformative for me, you know. So it all depends. But there's always millions of great books. But that's a good question. Thank you. So I got, I got another question. <laughs> for the question. Oh. Do you want to show your video? Yeah. Did somebody else have a question? Go ahead, DJ. So my other question would be, so somebody like myself, no. I've been out, I've been past the three year mark just recently in December. And uh, so I got my own business, I'm working, um, my time is full every day, but I feel like I'm not connected to uh, helping others transition now, but I wanna be. And so my question would be, what would you recommend to somebody like myself who has spent all this time working, trying to get ahead, trying to make up for lost time. And then I find myself doing nothing but work, either working at the job or working on my house. And so I'm like, kind of just going through the motions and making money and I'm surviving and I'm actually thriving but I feel like I'm not really doing what I should be doing, which is reaching back into the place I came from to help these guys make that transition. So, you know, organizations or what, I mean, what kind of advice would you have for somebody like me who, who feels like there's more life than just making money? <clears throat> no, for sure. Cause you bring up a huge important point. 
And I, I didn't mention earlier, it's on my list of things is you want, uh, you can, I cannot succeed if I succeed alone. That's like mm -hmm. in one of my bios and one of my places or somewhere. Mm -hmm. But so I look back at my experiences in prison. There were so many people that impacted me, that helped me and developed me in good ways. So I feel as if I left a whole bunch of people who will never get out. And so I have to live their life for them. And then, and so that's kind of, so for one example is I, you know, rented out one of my homes and helped them be successful. Um, I think there's a lot of organizations you can get in, in the, in the Denver area that work to um, um, meet, uh, meet the needs of guys first coming out. Mentorship and coaching, I mean, it's a two-way street. You need some too, because you're only three years out. So it's good to have a mentor and, and be a mentee and then also mentor. That way it's a, it's a circle of people helping other people and be invested in seeing others succeed because that's your payoff. No money, just the fact that you help someone get uh, get further along in their life. Oh, and that's, that's important. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. No, that's real good, uh, Danny. That's good advice. DJ, man, I'm gonna help you out. You got a pen and paper? Man, you 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 tap right down my alley, cat. I'm gonna I'm, I'm just gonna be real with you. That's exactly what I do. See, just listening to your conversation, I realized that uh, you identified a purpose. You know, you have you have a vision and realize that there's something more than life that uh, that you can be doing. My man's go over to DwayneHRoberts.com. I want you to go over and schedule a, a, a discovery call with me, a free discovery call with me. I'm going to help you bring your dream, your vision to fruition. I'm going to walk you through some steps, some processes, coach you through some steps and processes to help you uh, really get to that place in life you're trying to get to. I think you got you got a tangible question. You got a a, a big heart. Yep. Um, and I think you know where to go. You just need guidance. Nobody needs to tell you. You just need that coach uh, to really uh, inspire you, motivate you, and point you in the right, lead you in the right direction, man. So be sure to uh, go over, schedule that appointment with your boy. It's much like what Danny says. You you need a coach. You need a mentor. Um, and that is exactly who and what I do. Listen, I got we got time for one more question. I know we're a little over, but uh, one more question for for Danny, uh, guys, and then we're gonna kind of close this thing out. Miss Deborah, I see your hand up. Go ahead, ma'am. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, so, Danny, one of the things that I really um, admire about you is the way you choose to um, surround yourself with people that encourage you, inspire you. Um, and all that. And I'm just wondering, like, what do you look for in your friends and your mentors? What are those characteristics that you look for? <clears throat> well, it's kind of like, um, I look up, you know, uh, not until recently did I start really trying to help others. So for a lot of first six years or more, I really had to work on myself. And what I found, um, you have to cultivate a multicultural, so, uh, multi-economic, social economic um, friend base. And because I can't, if I'm, like, so this is my philosophy in, in sports, <coughs> is if I'm the best player on your team, we're gonna lose, but, if I'm the worst player on my team, our team is awesome. So I want to be, I'm great. I believe I'm amazing. I'm not saying that I'm not good enough to carry, oh, I am saying I'm not good enough to carry a team. But the idea is you want to be a value add kind of person, but you want to have people that have this much more experience, this much more knowledge, this much more value. Because then when we all say we have five of us come together, Man, that's a killer group of people that are, can change the world. But if I got to try to pull up all my homies and everybody all at once, and I'm the leader, that's not my role yet. I'm still working to get to that level where I could be that impactful. But at this point in my life, I need to be the worst player on the best team. And that's kind of what I do. Oh, that's real good. Real good, Danny. I appreciate it. Listen, I, I missed this hand up. Dan Daniel Morales, you got a question, buddy? 
come off mute, uh, mute and uh, ask yes, your questions. Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. I think uh, I have a question. <laughs> I think I met you already, <laughs> and I already know the speaker. He's my son. But what do you think about prisoners? They think about their, what the family thinks about them? Fathers, mothers, and how can they help in their situation? Or can they help? They do help. Um, all the letters, uh, you know, just uh, the visits. Um, I think one thing my parents did, um, that guy right there, is when I was enthusiastically progressing in, in my life, wanting to start a business, wanting having ideas and goals, he'd be there to listen and encourage me and uh, help come to fruition some of those ideas. And um, you can, it's hard to have a, a, just a true belief of self if the people who born you don't believe in you. So, and I think this goes for other parents who have kids that are getting involved in drugs or getting, you know, walking that thin line to possibly going to prison is it's not about enablement. It's about a healthy dialogue of what it is that, what the value you see of them. And I don't care if it's the worst kid in the world, you could say, hey, you're bad. your behavior is bad, but you as a person, as an individual is good. And so now we work to develop and cut off the edges of the things that are bad. So I think that is at core what is needed from the family when they're so far away. And I recognize uh, my family um, from my siblings to my kids, uh, my, even my kids uh, on the call today. And she had a great comment about uh, when you first, one of your first questions, she's right on point. She's a great college student doing really well. Um, but the key is and, and as a as a offender, I recognize that I have hurt all these people as secondarily by taking my energy and my life away from them and the loss that they felt. And so that's one of my motivating energies is I cannot get in trouble and go back because the amount of hurt that will cause them all over again. I've messed up once. I can't afford to mess up again. There's too much on the line. Wow. Man, that's 100 Man, good question and, and, and an absolutely uh, amazing response and answer to that to that question, Danny. That was that's really heartfelt. Um, really take my hat off to you on that one, Kat. That's big time. Listen, guys, uh, really want to close this thing out. Be respectful of your time. I want to just say the special thanks to Danny for taking the time joining us this evening. Also, uh, for each one of you chiming in um, and joining us in the conversation. Uh, listen, be sure to go check out uh, Men of Vision uh, Colorado web uh, webpage. Um, there we, we are raising funds to, to really do the work and, and uh, really impact lives, you know. Also, uh, you see, see uh, trying to get my thoughts here together here. Sorry about that. Um, if you're an individual looking, you're struggling in life, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out how you can uh, advance, get to the places in life you're trying to go. Listen, be sure to go over to DwayneHRoberts.com. Schedule your free discovery call with your boy. Listen, I'm, I am, I, I believe in you. I look to help you level up and win in life. You know, so uh, join me. Let's join together. Let's connect in authentic conversation and let's see how we can grow and learn together. Any last words, guys? Yeah, I'd like to share my screen and show you what, where I am right now. All right, so this is what hard work gets. And it wasn't done alone. There's people who have helped me along this way. And this is only the beginning. I'm going to use this land that I have here. I have a lot of lands here and, and to be a benefit to the community. And every blessing that I can get is because I'm willing to share with whoever I, whatever I have. And that's the key to success. Wow, man. Amazing. So that, that's Castle del Estelon. Did I say it right? 
I'm jacking it all up. Casa de, Casa de Aslan. Yeah, sound good to me. Listen, guys. Listen, man. I, I, I really appreciate you, Danny, man. I really thank you for taking the time with us. Um, for you guys who stayed tuned, timed in with us, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, by all means, um, you find individuals that need some help, please put them in contact. You can get my information uh, from my webpage at Men of Vision Colorado or off of the Facebook page, Men of Vision Colorado. Hey, I'm your boy D-Rob and I say success is in your hands. God bless.